Great. So welcome, this is the 36th District Democrats. We are really delighted to be interviewing Evan Briggs today for school board position three. Over to you, Evan, to introduce yourself and welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm Evan Briggs. I am um, running for school board for district three. Um, I am the mom of three SPS students. I have um, a third grader, a seventh grader, and a ninth grader. So we, we have three kids at three different schools, elementary, middle, and high school. Um, we've been in Seattle Public Schools for nine years so far, and I have about 10 years to go. So um, we're pretty deep in right now, um, and will be for a while. Um, I'm a documentary filmmaker. That's my profession. And um, and yeah, that's that's just a little bit about me. Thank you so much, Evan. Our first question this morning will be presented by Toby. Over to you, Toby. Excuse me. Hi. Why are you running for school board? That's a great question. Um, I think the, the really short answer to that is I'm running for school board because I believe that every single kid in the city, regardless of the neighborhood that they live in, is entitled to a high quality education. And I think a high quality education is defined by the three R's, rigor, relevance, and relationships. And, um, and so I really, really believe that that is our obligation to provide that opportunity for every, every single kid in this, in this city. So that's sort of my big picture reason for running. Um, the, the sort of real honest answer to that too is that I was heavily encouraged to run for this position by a number of people in my community um, because of my past advocacy um, in my kids' schools around specifically racial equity, which is another top concern of mine. Um, a lot of people are very surprised to learn that Seattle has one of the worst opportunity gaps um, between black and white students in the nation. Um, and I think that comes as a surprise to a lot of people because we think of Seattle as being a really liberal place um, where we wouldn't see such a disparity. Um, but the fact is that, that that disparity exists and it is the legacy of redlining in the city. And, um, you know, you can, you can hold up a map of neighborhoods that were redlined and then overlay it with schools that are resourced today and ones that aren't. And, and the matchup is pretty clear. So, um, I think we have a lot of work to do as a city, um, to sort of desegregate housing and making sure that every kid, regardless of the neighborhood they live in, is able to access quality education. Thank you so much. Yeah. The next question this morning will be asked by Sherry. Hi, uh, enrollment in Seattle Public Schools has declined since 2020. What steps would you take to reverse this decline? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question. I've I've been doing a lot of um, re research and reading around this um, because this is actually a nationwide problem. Um, public school en enrollment is just down across the country, um, and this is mostly at the elementary school level. At the high school level, um, we're seeing mostly um, like maintained levels of enrollment, or or in some cases increased, um, and so. What appears to be happening is that a lot of families post pandemic made the choice to continue to homeschool their kids. And I think one of the important steps that we could take as a district is to in really increase our family engagement and reach out to those families and figure out how we can better partner with them so that they can be assured that their children's needs will be met in our schools. Um, and also to even consider the possibility of more hybrid options for, for families for whom that would be a better fit. Um, I think those are some things we could do to, um, to attract more students. Um, I also, uh, wait, I have a couple of notes about this that I wanted to be sure to mention. Um, so, um, wait, I'm sorry, I am actually looking at the wrong thing. Um, so, oh yeah, so another uh, really, uh, yes, this is, this is really important. Um, I also 
we we have the ability to to work with the state to figure out where kids go when they leave our district. And um, we haven't done that. We have not availed ourselves of that opportunity. And so I think that is a really important step that the district needs to take is to follow up with the state to, to, to track where students go when they leave our district. Um, I also think that we need to increase equitable um, access to advanced learning programs. And, and um, yeah, out of time. Thank you, Evan. Our mm -hmm. next question this morning will be asked by Laura Marie. Hi, Evan. Uh, okay. How will you uphold the rights, dignity, safety, and inclusion of all the students? And what would be your specific focus to do so? So one of my top priorities um, is addressing the mental health crisis, the youth mental health crisis that our kids are facing right now. Um, so I think we need to have more mental health professionals in buildings. And I think we also need to be using our schools as hubs to provide more of a continuum of care for, for students and families who need that. Um, I think we also need to focus on culturally responsive curriculum, um, which includes teaching the true history of the United States. Um, I think students should be able to learn their native language um, in, in school during the school day using online programs. And this is happening for the first time for native students um, this year at Roosevelt High School, actually, which is really, exciting. Um, and then also in June of 2020, the board passed a resolution affirming the rights of the LGBTQ plus community um, and students. I think we need to make that a policy. Um, I think the board needs to, to make that an official policy so that um, every kid, every kid needs to come to school and feel safe and seen as a whole person. Um, and so I think another another thing that we need to address is is gun safety, and um, and just it, including curriculum around the history of violence in this country and um, and what the underlying causes of that are, um, which again often ties back to to mental health issues. And so I think there's a lot of partnerships that we could be bolstering and establishing with community um, and city organizations as well around ensuring increased community safety. Thank you so much, Evan. The mm -hmm. final prepared question before we go to follow-ups will be asked by Shep. What are your thoughts on addressing the budget deficit? And if necessary, how would you approach deciding which schools to close? Um, so, and okay, the timer wasn't going last time actually, so I was not sure how long I had. Anyway, it's going up. Um, yeah, so the budget deficit is obviously a big issue on everybody's mind. Um, I think that we really need to ensure that our financial decisions are aligning with what's in the best interest of kids. Um, and we need to be sh have data that we can rely on that is showing us where our dollars are going that is actually materially benefiting kids. And so that obviously means keeping cuts away from the classroom to whatever extent possible. Um, as far as school consolidation goes, um, I think it's really important that students have access to well-resourced schools. Um, so if, if we are able to provide more comprehensive services, um, I think that's an important factor to consider. However, um, we do have some key programs that serve some of our highest need students. And I think it's really important to ensure that those programs continue to exist, um, even if they have to exist in a different building. Um, so, so basically it's, um, I think there's just a lot of factors involved in, in determining which schools should close. I mean, we have some really, really tiny schools that have 120 kids enrolled in it and, and they don't want, and my kids go to, um, or my elementary school kid goes to a really small school. And um, it's really under-enrolled. And every year they have to decide, are we gonna get an art teacher? Are we gonna get a counselor? Um, there, you know, There's always shuffling around of staff. Sometimes we lose a teacher a week into the school year and it's really disruptive for the kids. It's not, it's not a well-resourced um, situation. And so I think focusing on making sure that all kids have access to, to a school that is well-resourced while also maintaining 
small programs that are serving our highest needs kids. Thank you, Evan. We'll now move to the follow-up part of our discussion and conversation with you. And these questions will have a minute um, answer and I will see who wants to ask the first one amongst the e-board members. And seeing no hand pop up immediately, I will ask if you wanna dive in more around, you were having a, a very thoughtful response around the decline and what we're doing on that. And if there was more that you wanted to layer into that question that we asked you earlier and some more thoughts you wanted to share. Yeah, thank you. I didn't get to complete my last little bit there. Um, but I, I do think that um, there's also a, an, an, an opportunity to work with the community on this issue around um, housing affordability and safety issues. So um, just, I think it's really a multi-pronged approach and some of these, some of the issues that we face are issues that the school board alone or the district alone is not gonna be able to address. And I think this is where um, I'm a really big proponent of really increasing the robustness of our community and city partnerships. Cause I think um, we are just so much stronger when we band together and with common interest. So um, that's just another uh, facet to how I think we could um, address some of the declining enrollment issues. Thank you so much, Evan. Mm -hmm. Laura Marie. Hi, Evan. The question I like to ask our candidates is, can you tell us something that you have learned about this role that you think other people might not know and or something that is particularly interesting to you about the school board director role? Wow, that is a great question. Um, I think what's been really interesting to me um, in, in the last few months um, of, of running for this position is just how few people actually do seem to understand what the role of the school board actually is um, and, and how much, um, you know, and I think that that another one of my priorities is, um, is just really dramatically improving community engagement. And I think part of that is making sure that everybody in the community does actually know exactly what, what the, the role of the school board is. And, um, and so I think there's a lot of, a lot we could do there. And I think when everybody under, kind of has a, has a, a shared understanding of what, what the, what the roles and responsibilities are of the board, then, then everybody's more on the same page about what, what needs, what needs to be done, what can be done and what are the limitations of the board. Thank you, Evan. Jeremy. Um, yeah, so my daughter just started third grade. Um, she has a class size of 32 students. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, class sizes? Um, is that type of class size acceptable? And if not, what would you as a school board director do about it? Um, you know, I actually read um, a study that ranked what the um, what the most like significant determinants of of good outcomes and students um, school experience was and I was surprised at how far down the list class size was um, because I feel like the impulse is to always assume that that is is a really important factor um, and I think I think um, what's what what this research that I was reading was communicating was it's really more about the the teacher um, I know class sizes man is capped at the state level. So I think 32 students in third grade is feels feels like a really large class, um, especially in those younger, younger grades. Um, I know kids, you know, the younger they are, the the more indiv individualized attention they should be entitled to. Um, so that does sound like a really large class size. Ooh. Thank you, Evan. Yeah. Yeah, going back a couple of questions uh, about the interaction between the school board and the city, <laughs> excuse me, and housing and those issues. The city's comp plan is being developed that for completion next year, and it's like a once every five or more year effort. 
Do you have any specific thoughts about how to deal with that and what issues you would want to address? Sorry, I'm I'm not familiar with what the, the city's COP plan. Is that what you said? Yeah, the comprehensive plan. Oh, um, um yeah, I don't I honestly like I I I'm not I, I'm not very familiar with the city's comprehensive plan. So I don't feel like I can intelligently respond to that question at the moment. Um, I think, you know, I've, I have, as far as partnerships go, I have already started um, meeting with various stakeholders and um, people who are involved and, and at the city and community level and in areas where I feel like there's um, partnership potential with the district. Um, but I'm not, I don't, I don't have a lot of insight into the city's comprehensive plan at this, at this point. I, I really appreciate your forthrightness in acknowledging that. <laughs> Amanda? Sorry, just trying to multitask. Um, so you mentioned, this is going back kind of a follow-up to the safety and inclusion, and you also mentioned kind of the ongoing effects of the pandemic. And my question is around um, kind of the aspects of COVID safety and particularly students um, who themselves are vulnerable or are living with vulnerable families and how we may ensure that they have access to education, full participation, and whether there are things that we can do as the school district, such as, you know, air quality or other kinds of measures that would improve this, um, not, not just for COVID transmission, but for all kinds of good things. So just to be sure I'm understanding your question is sort of what, what do, what are my thoughts on what the district can do mm -hmm. To make it safer for kids mm -hmm. to come to school if they have, if there are any kind of health mm -hmm. issues for them or family members that they live with. Yeah, that's a great yeah. way of rephrasing it. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think air quality, obviously, that I mean, so that that's just um there's just a lot of data around how important it is to improve air quality in not only schools, but all buildings that people inhabit during the day. Um, and it's not just COVID, it's obviously, you know, RSV has been resurgent and um, there's all kinds of respiratory illnesses. Um, so that's certainly, that's certainly one avenue. Um, I also think, um, yeah, I mean, there just needs to, we, we really need to have, um, I, again, I feel like this is where it's so important that the school, that individual schools feel a real sense of community, because I feel like um, build, this is one of those things that, that really, um, can be best addressed building by building, just based on, um, you know, there's there might be a student at a particular school who has a, a really specific health issue that needs to be addressed in a certain way. And when the community is all on the same page about that, then it, that those needs can be met. Thank you so much, Evan. I'm going to pause to see if there is another follow-up question from our e-board. And if there isn't, offer you a, a last minute to kind of share anything you want, you know, any answer you wanted to expand on or any kind of closing thoughts. We don't have a formal closing, um, but if there's, you know, anything you want us to know uh, or anything else in, in, in terms of the questions we've already posed to you that you wanted to share for our last moment. Thank you. Um, yeah, so one thing that I, that I really want to mention um, that I have learned a lot about in the last couple of months through a lot of my conversations with various board members is um, sort of the, the new system of student outcomes focused governance and, and how this has transformed the working relationship between the superintendent and the school board. And I know that our district has been plagued with a lot of dysfunction for many years. And I think a lot of this, um, and this is backed by research, comes down to school districts where there's an adversarial relationship between the board and the superintendent have really poor outcomes. And, and I think that that is often overlooked as sort of like a deep cause of some of the larger systemic issues that have plagued our district. Um, and so I'm just really actually encouraged by what seems to be an increasing, a, a, a dramatically improved dynamic between the board and the current superintendent. And I think that that really has a top down like when that's functioning well, it's good for the whole district. Evan, thank you so much. This concludes the formal part of our conversation with you today. And we will now 